Turn your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to talk about how to do ministry this morning. So in the month of January, we've done some how-to kind of things, and uh, we talked about how to have a quiet time and how to share the gospel message, how to pray, how to study your Bible, and today we're going to talk about how to do ministry. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, this is probably a super well-known chapter, at least half of it, uh, for lots and lots of people. It uh, gets, gets picked for lots of different things. Valentine's Day is coming up, uh, weddings, uh, different, different things like that. But this is one of those things, last week we talked about how important context is. And the context of this particular chapter is astronomically important because we find it in the context of Paul talking to a very, very immature church about spiritual gifts. And when you talk about ministry, most of the time churches talk about spiritual gifts. And they even do things like uh, having spiritual gifts inventories that you take and you need to determine your spiritual gift and they go through all these different classes and, and, you know, and basically all those are is glorified personality tests. I've looked at, at multiple of them and, and one of the things that, that we realize from Scripture is, is that spiritual gifts are just that. They are spiritual. Your personality, that's your soul. Remember, this book has the ability to divide between soul and spirit. So God can take someone who's not a good orator and gift them to be able to speak. Amen? And, and God can take someone like Noah, who's never built a boat before, and cause them to be able to build a boat. And God can take Bezalel and Aholiab and give them the ability to build the ark and all the instruments and furnishings for the tabernacle. And, and God can gift you to do anything that he wants for you to do. That's the whole point of spiritual gifts. They come with the Spirit of God whenever he moves into you. Okay, But one of the things that I will never do is put you through a spiritual gifts inventory test. Because I think that's nothing but an incredible waste of time. Uh, that is to take modern psychology and put it on top of the church, in my opinion. If we needed a spiritual gifts test, there'd be one in the Bible. Amen? Instead, in the middle of talking about spiritual gifts, what do we find? We find chapter 13. And chapter 13 is of the utmost importance. And this is how you do ministry. All right? This is how you do ministry. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity... I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known." And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for your spirit to help us understand the word of God this morning. We pray, Lord, that uh, you'd help us to realize what it is to, to do ministry and what it is that we truly need to empower us for ministry, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Well, as we, as we read this, I've I got to remind you that King James Version uses the word charity here, and, and I believe it does it for a really important reason. Uh, what it is uh, translating is the Greek word agape or agapeo, which is one of the Greek words that we translate love. <clears throat> the Greek language actually has three or four different words that in English we would simply translate as love. You have Philadelphia or brotherly love. You have eros or an erotic kind of love. And then you have agape. And agape is the kind of love that God has for us. In John 3.16, it uses the word agape, and there it translates it love. And so lots of people say, why did those old King James translators do that? Well, I think the whole reason is to, to show that in this particular context that he's setting it apart. And, and he calls it charity. And if we were to go back 400 years in time, we'd see that it probably has a little bit different meaning uh, and is used a little differently than we do today. When we talk about charity, we mean giving something to, you know, to the, the, the boys' uh, uh, ranch or something like that. Uh, but, but really, what that word is, is, is love. And it is a self-giving love. Love gives. That's the whole point, all right? And so, so as, we, as we read this chapter and we remember that this is placed in the context of spiritual gifts, let me just say to you that spiritual gifts are tools, they're not toys. Spiritual gifts are tools that the Holy Spirit manifests in believers to get ministry done, all right? They're tools, they're not toys. And, and what the Corinthians were doing is they were treating spiritual gifts like toys, much like we see in our world today. And so... Why is this so important? Well, the first thing we want to see is, is the nullification of ministry. Nullification means to zero something out, to make it obsolete, to turn it off, to shut it down. If you want to shut down real, godly, Christ-like, Holy Spirit-motivated ministry, just do what he says in the first three verses. And basically, he sums it up like this. Speaking without love is nothing but noise. Knowledge without love is nothing but nonsense, and sacrificial giving without love is nothing. So, in other words, it doesn't matter what you do. If you do it with the wrong motivation, it doesn't count. Now, we just talked about uh, rewards as we looked at our catechism questions today, and we talked about some of those crowns that Jesus is going to give. But I want you to think about this for a minute. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Just somebody beating on a gong. If you get up and speak in the context of talking about God and the things of God and you don't have love, all you're doing is making noise. Now think about that. So what's more important? An eloquent tongue or a heart full of love? Well, it's, it's love. We've already seen as, as we looked at what Paul thought about rhetoric, as, as we, we looked there in 1 Corinthians, as he says, you know, I, when I came to you, I came with nothing more than, than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He, he wasn't concerned about being a silver-tongued orator. He came to them because He loved them. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So, in other words... If you want to do ministry, you need to love people. That's the only requirement. Isn't that great? Man, I, I love that. You see, I, I think it's to totally miss the point to try to figure out what your spiritual gift is and make your, your perfect place in the church. This is something we see from the megachurch mentality, you know, because what they're doing is running a volunteerism. And so, you know, if we can get lots and lots of volunteers, we need to put you in the right spot. And if you're in the wrong spot, you know, it's this whole idea that we have now that I never heard of within the last, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, you know. You have to love your job. If you don't love your job, well, then you need a new job. And, you know, I was kind of taught, thank God you've got a job. Amen? By the way, see Mike Rowe for more. Anyway, so, so he says uh, in verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy... And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Oh man, now we've got somebody who is gifted unbelievably. Man, they can sit down and explain to us what sublapsarian Calvinism really is. 
Amen? But if I don't have love, if I don't have this charity, he says, I'm nothing. All my understanding, all my knowledge is nothing but nonsense. This is the trap that the Ephesian church fell into. You remember in Revelation, as the Lord Jesus dictates the letter to the Ephesian church, he tells them, he said, man, you guys are great with your doctrine. These guys come in, you figure out that they're false apostles, you shut them down and you send them on their way. Yet I have this one thing against you. What did he say? You left your first love. You see, love, it doesn't matter how much you know. Man, I know some of these preachers. They can answer any theological question, or so they think, you know. But they're mean as a snake. You can't talk to them. They could care less whether what's going on in your life. They just, they're just building their big ministry. And sometimes we see these things, and they get built up real big, and then kaboom, because they don't love people. You see, should we try to gain knowledge? Of course, last week we talked about studying your Bible. It's important. But to be a know-it-all and not love people accomplishes nothing in the Christian life. And then the third thing, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. This is the utmost of benevolence. All my goods. I give away everything. Not only that, I throw my body on the fire. <clears throat> my body is given to be burned. I, I give myself completely to something. And I don't have charity. It profiteth me nothing. There's no crowns for ministry done apart from love. Man, you know, <clears throat> as I think about that, and, and I think, I, I, I step back away from that and I say, you know, love is motivation, okay? That, that's what it is. Love is motivation. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved us. That's why he allowed his son to come and do what he did to go to the cross to shed his precious blood for us because God loves us. And love always gives, all right? It always gives. And so, so this is how you nullify ministry. Let me go back with you into the very last verse there of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He's talked, the whole thing, he's talked about spiritual gifts. And he's used the illustration or metaphor of a body. And we all come together, and someone is a hand, and someone is a foot, and someone is an eye, and this is the way spiritual gifts work. Okay? We're not all the same. We don't all have the same gifts. God gives different gifts, and the Holy Spirit gives them severally as He will. So, in other words, you can't have all the gifts. Nobody needs all the gifts. That wouldn't make any sense at all. When, when we all come together, your gift benefits others. My gift benefits others. We all bring our gifts. It's like a potluck dinner, you know? I mean, we all come together, we all put it out there on the table, we, may, we got a whole meal. But, you know, by yourself, I brought the dessert, that's not a very nutritious meal. That's, that's the part that I brought. But, if you go ahead and tack that on to the end of eating something green and some meat, well, and some taters, and some iced tea, well, then you're okay, right? Somebody said, amen. All right, anyway, so, so that's his point. That's, that's the illustration he uses. We're like a body. We, we are called the body of Christ. And, and there's all these different parts. And even some parts that you can't even see, like your pituitary or your thyroid. I can't see it. I've never seen one. Appendix, the only ones I've ever seen had been yanked out, right? But boy, are they important. It's down there doing its thing, right? And nobody can see it. The church is exactly the same way. Some gifts you can see, some you can't, but they're all important. But look what he says, verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts. And what he's saying there, that is a plural, as your church. What are the best gifts? He's going to spend a whole chapter on the best gifts, which is prophecy. Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. What does that mean? We need to know the Bible. That's what we need to know. We need to, we need to hear from God. That's the most important gift. Not tongues. Tongues is way down at the end of the list, okay? Isn't it amazing? This is, by the way, if you ever leave here and you go somewhere else, and you're looking for a different church, and they practice all the gifts, right? If tongues takes preeminence, run, because that's not the way it's supposed to be. Anyway, <clears throat> covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. That is so important. What, what's he talking about? He's talking about using spiritual gifts for ministry in the church. What is the most excellent way? 
is it to learn specifically what your gift is and then don't go outside of your gifting as you serve and only do that one thing? No! The more excellent way is to love people. Quit worrying about what your spiritual gift is and start loving people. That's the whole point. Then he goes on to say, look, it doesn't matter what your gift is if you use it apart from love. It nullifies it. It's no good whatsoever. And then he says... In verses 4 through 7, he's going to give us the nature of love. He's going to break it down. Uh, I think there's 15 different things here that he's going to break down. And these are fantastic as we look at this. What does real love look like? A selfless, giving, agape love that the Bible calls charity. What does it look like? Well, he says, first of all, love suffereth long. That means to have patient endurance. This is how people stay married for 50 and 60 years. Amen? Because they have patience with each other. Two sinners sinning on different paths from different families who learned how to sin differently move in together and last more than two years. It is miraculous. Amen? And that's what marriage is, right? So I've been married about two years. Get ready because now comes the patient endurance, right? Well, but, but also in the church, patient endurance. Man, we're all very different. We have different likes, different dislikes. We have different uh, uh, abilities and gifts and talents and, and all of these kind of things. And, and we all come together. And if we're going to love one another, we have to patiently endure one another. Because y'all don't all like me. <laughs> but you have to patiently endure me, right? And so, so then he says, love is kind. That means disposed to do good to others. You know, I, I have this, I heard this saying years ago, and I believe it down to the very, to my, my toes. A person who is rude to the waitress is rude. I don't care how they treat other people. In other words, kindness does not show itself with partiality. Kindness is kind. Kind to other people, all other people, different people. People like me, people different than me, people that, you know, that, that have lower Uh, quality of jobs than I think that I do or whatever kindness it's it's the disposition to do good to other people love envieth not it's not jealous see one of the problems in the Corinthian church was that they were jealous of the showy gifts oh man and and still to this day I mean I mean there is a denomination in our world that says the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues So, i.e., every believer that truly is a believer must speak in tongues. And if you don't speak in tongues, they will send you to a class to teach you how to speak in tongues. And what countless people in this denomination do is they get the yomala, shomala, shomala, bakhtanai, shomala, yomala, yomala, bakhtanai. And as long as you spit that out in the right context, they go, there it is, boom, you're in, brother. (sighs) And then they never do it again. They do it, they fake it, get Let me in and leave me alone. And they fly under the radar for the rest of their time in that denomination. The entire 12th chapter tells us, do all, a rhetorical question, do all speak with tongues? The answer is no. It is no. They do not. They did not and they do not if they still do. And so... So you've got this, this problem that happened in the Corinthian church that they were looking at the people that were exercising the showier gifts and they were getting jealous. Well, and the opposite of jealousy is pride. Boy, I get puffed up like a bandy rooster because I have this kind of a gift, which is the very next thing. Not only does love not envy or to be jealous, but it vaunteth not itself. That means to boast or brag, to vaunt. And just think about a a rooster. The Barker House, by the way, if you want to observe this, they were just talking about this this morning. They've got some some roosters around there. And boy, you know how he, you know, he he walks around like this. And if you're not real careful, that old rooster, he'll get mean, boy. And then he just, he'll attack anything. Doesn't matter how big it is, attack a dog, horse, you, anything, you know. Even though he's this little bitty thing, you just boot him all the way across the yard. But he walks around like this. (sighs) That's why we call him the cock of the walk, right? That's where that comes from. Well, that's not love. Love doesn't do that. And what happens sometimes is, is we look outside of the church for our heroes, and we look 
to sports and we look at athletes and we watch the way they boast and they brag and look at me and I'm so great and they're not all that way, thank God. Some of them are actually believers who know better than to do that. And it's so refreshing when you hear them get interviewed. And they're very humble about their interview. So praise God for those men and women. But, but real love does not boast and brag. Matter of fact, it's so important that Paul puts this twice because guess what? This is the very first sin. Even before Adam and Eve, the very first sin is the sin of pride. This is what Satan had that got him, is to be puffed up and built up with pride. And so love is not puffed up. It's not proud or haughty. And, and so, you know, if you're going to love somebody, if you're going to love and show the kind of love that Christ shows, it's not going to be a puffed up and prideful thing. It's not going to be a jealous thing. Love does not behave itself unseemly. That means to be unbecoming or indecent. So we're not talking about anything having to do with eros kind of love when we talk about agape kind of love. It's not unseemly or it's not unbecoming. In other words, it's not rude or gross or disgusting or perverted or inappropriate. Love is, is never any of those things. And so if you love somebody, you're going to use appropriate language and appropriate mannerisms as you communicate with them and as you spend time with them. Love seeketh not her own. Please notice there that it says her own. The reason for that is, is that charity in the Greek is a, ne is a feminine. Uh, so you have feminine, you have neuter, and you have masculine kinds of words in the Greek, and everything has to be in alignment. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because we're going to see that here in just a minute. But it says it seeketh not her own. In other words, love is not selfish. Love does not use people. Real love does not use people. You know, uh, <coughs> throughout my ministry, I've had people come to my church who were running for office uh, only to drop off the planet after they got elected or not elected, whichever may be the case. Uh, it was disgusting, and I could, watch it. I could watch it happen. Came home one day, I told Wendy, I said, the only reason they're here is because this church has a good reputation, and they're running for a particular office. <laughs> and what do you know, once it was all over, oh, by the way, they invited, Pastor, would you come? Because we're having, you know, we're having one of those meet and greet, you know, which is sip and slick a check is what that is for the politician. Oh, man. Anyway, I've had people come who wanted to sell Amway or Mary Kay or build their downline or were looking for a place where they could show off or, you know, I mean, you just got all these, hey, there's a church, I can use that church to get to where I want to be. That's not love. That, that, that's, that has nothing to do with ministry whatsoever. Churches are not stepping stones. By the way, pastors do the same thing. Coming from a small country church, I've seen it time and time and time again. I'll serve at this church for a while until I can get on the radar screen of a bigger church. And, and I, I even think some people are even taught this. Well, your first church, you know, it's probably going to be a little country church or something. You know, I served there about a year and a half, two years. And then, you know, make sure you go to all the meetings and all everything and get your name out there. And then pretty soon, one of these bigger churches will call you and, you know, away you can go. That's not love. And I, I tell you what, I've got some friends that have pastored in small communities for their entire ministry. You want to know why? Because it's what God has called them to and because they love people. And they're not worried about how big or how much money or whatever. They're not worried. They just want to love. They love people. They love Jesus. They love people. That's what love is. So it, it, it doesn't seek her own. Is not easily provoked. Man, oh man, do we live in the world of, oh, I'm offended. And I'm offended, so I'm going to burn your house down and destroy you. I don't ever want to see you, you know. I love it. Social media. Oh, I'm offended. I have to get you canceled. No, all you have to do is scroll like that. When, just, you're, they're gone. I, that, they're behind you. They're, they're, they're gone. You can't even, you, can't, you don't even know they existed. Or even better, just push the little button and they'll delete that person and you don't ever have to look at their junk again. 
But oh no, I have to comment and I have to and and I have to find something wrong with them and go around and try to get them canceled and get them in trouble and find that dirt on them and investigate them and oh because I hate them because they offended me. Well, that's not love. Love is not easily offended, it is not easily provoked, it is not easily angered. Love doesn't doesn't go for that, it doesn't fall for that trap. In other words, it doesn't walk in with a chip on its shoulder and go, I dare you, I dare you to touch this chip. We all know people like this. We might have people like this in our family that everybody just has to tiptoe around them all the time because every little thing just, boom, just sets them off. Well, what they're suffering from is a lack of love. They, they don't love other people because when you love other people, it, now, do words hurt? You better believe they do. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's good, and you should say that. But we all know that when somebody says something ugly or nasty, it hurts. It does. But what should we do with that? Should we turn that to vengeance and get provoked and angry and try to... No, no, no. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. What we should do with that is we should take that to Jesus. We should tell Jesus, Lord, I, man, they said this hurts me. If they're a brother or sister in Christ, we should go to them. We should say, hey, I, I, you know, you said this. This really hurt my feelings. I, I didn't like this or that or the other. Or, you know, we should deal with it as adults and not as children. But the whole point is, is it's when you love, you're not easily provoked. Uh, this next one's fun. Thinketh no evil. The, the Greek word actually means to take an inventory and then to hold a grudge. So this is how this works. I have a notebook. And in this notebook, I have read, I may not actually have a notebook, but I got it up here. And everything that you have ever done that I did not like is written in that notebook. I keep it all there. And there's, there's, these, little, there's these little switches in there. And like maybe every five times or ten times. And when you hit one of those switches, bam, it takes me to the next one and now I'm provoked. You see, I can put up with this for a while and I put up with it, 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 and then it just, you know, it's like the pressure cooker, and the kids come running through, and pow, the top blows off, right? And I just blow it. But love doesn't do that. Love, love doesn't hold these grudges and allow a root of bitterness to grow up in you. That is such a big deal. The writer to the Hebrews told the Hebrew Christians, beware and don't let this happen, this, this root of bitterness in your heart. How do you deal with that? Well, because love forgives, and it forgives quickly. And it forgives whether they ask for forgiveness or not and it doesn't keep this record because guess what when you keep that record the only person that you are hurting with that record is you and you're just sitting there waiting I put up with you 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 but I'm not putting up with you anymore at this point and then you blow it right so go back to number one love suffereth long see they they all they all kind of tie together right Love doesn't hold grudges, is the, is the point. It, it rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Love loves truth. And that's, that's really important. By the way, we're going to talk about what do you do about people breaking the law and people doing bodily harm to you and all that kind of stuff. But, but as, you, as you love people, you rejoice in the truth. You don't rejoice in iniquity. You know what? One of the things that I see happen is, and, and, and this can happen in any family, lost or saved, and that is that I know something is wrong, but if it shows up in my family, I will defend my family member to the death, even though I know what they're doing is wrong. You see, love can never rejoice in iniquity, ever. So, so if you have a, a person that you love and they are in iniquity, you can love them, but you don't rejoice in what they're doing or whatever it is that they are, have done or are caught up in, right? Instead, love rejoices in the truth. We're always looking for truth. If you really love people, you're looking for truth. And that goes at every level. That goes with our government. Man, how can we rejoice when... When we've got iniquity codified, right? How can we rejoice when we have uh, the Roe versus Wade? We, we can't rejoice in that ever. Are we for women having rights? 
Of course are we for women having the right to murder an unborn child at will. Never, ever. Can you see? And so Roe versus Wade gets, gets returned, sent back to the States. What do we do as Christians? We rejoice. That's truth. Praise God. That's, that's truth in regards to God's Word. That's truth in regards to the Constitution of these United States and the Supreme Court actually doing what it's supposed to do. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. And we can rejoice in that. Now what do we do? Well, now we got another, <laughs> another war in every state, right? Once again, we see these things. But you see, love can love somebody without rejoicing in iniquity that they engage in, right? And so, then, it, then there's four things at the very end here in verse, uh, verse 7. These four things in verse 7, he kind of he sums it up. And this is so interesting to me, the way that he does this, okay? He uses some particular Greek words, and it almost sounds like he says the same thing twice, and he does... But he does it from the top and from the bottom. Let me explain this to you. He says there in verse 7, It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. All right, to bear something and to endure something, they kind of mean the same thing in English. And in Greek, they kind of mean the same thing. But here's what's so amazing about it. When he starts off in verse 7, the Holy Spirit tells us that love beareth all things. It uses a word that means to cover or to roof over something. So, so you, you, lo, love builds a roof over something. All right? The, the last one there, where it says it endureth all things, that is hupomone, and that is what you do when you do a squat. You bear up under something. You get underneath it, and you stay under the weight. That's what that word means. And so can you see... How, what love does is it encapsulates everything. Love builds a roof over and it bears all things. By the way, I don't know about you, but I grew up, my dad would tell me if my dad, if I needed to endure, I've never heard that word come out of my dad's mouth. You know what he'd say? Bear down. Right? We've got to pick up something heavy. Now bear down. It's heavy. You know what that means? It means it's heavy. <laughs> It also means I need you to hold this. I, I, I was the step and fetch it. We all, I built a bunch of corrals when I was a little kid. And I can tell you so many times I'm standing there holding a piece of pipe so dad can weld it, right? Because it could, you know, for 20 minutes he could have got come alongs and he could have braced it and clamped it and all, or he could get me, you know. Now bear down, it's heavy. Okay, lift it up a little bit. Whoa, right there. And you're like, boy, this is an awkward spot. I don't know how long I can just, hey, you're, Bear down, now hold it. Okay, okay, okay. All right, that is what endure means. And so, so look what he says. He says, love beareth all things. If I love you, I can put up with all kinds of stuff that I have to put up with, right? Hard stuff. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about sin necessarily. I mean, you know, real parents, they bear down when it comes to raising kids. Because guess what? Raising kids, it, it's not something that you get a break from that you walk away from and it's not something you quit on ever because you love them right and so you know that's why we use the term deadbeat dad amen you walk away from those kids <laughs> by golly they need they need their dad they need their mom they need the family they need somebody to love them they need a lot of help we got a nasty old world and they got to learn to live in it and and so it takes love and it takes a, a covering kind of a love that builds a roof over a family. And then it says, and, and this is the one that a lot of people don't like, it believeth all things. And so they say, your, your Bible teaches that love is naive. Never. Never, 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 never is love naive. That's not it at all. It's not naive. Love knows exactly what you're doing when you stayed out too late and you lied about coming in when you did. Love loves you in spite of that, is going to punish you because you did it, because it rejoices in the truth. Love is never going to love the, your rebellion, but it's never ever going to give up on you. Ever. No matter what you've done. I don't like your behavior, but I love you. I'm going to make life hard on you. You're going to, you're going to yield because I'm the dad. You ever heard that? As long as you live under my roof... 
as long as you live under my beareth all things, you're going to abide by my rules. I love you and I will take you to the woodshed, young one. Can I get an amen? So, so don't think that as it says it believeth all things. What it means is, is it never, ever, ever gives up. Love never, ever gives up. It always believes. And then, and then it ties to the next one. It hopeth all things. Love hopes that that lost person will get saved before they die. They're 80 years old and they still don't care. Don't ever give up. Love them. Believe in them. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the Holy Spirit. Keep on praying. Keep on bearing with them. Keep on bearing down underneath there and enduring the situation. This is how a wife stays with an unbelieving husband. This is how a, a woman stays with a guy that, that's mean to her. Uh, this is how a parent continues on with a difficult kid. This, this is how you do ministry. Do you see why I say, how do you do ministry? You love people. This is the stuff you need. Where do you get this? Can't get it at Lowe's. You can't get it on TV. You can't get it from a psychologist. You can't get it on social media. You know, on social media, you better get rid of that zero and get you a hero. Amen? I hear it all the time. My, my daughter is so embarrassed right now. All the time, talk shows. I see it from people posting on Facebook, you know. Get rid of all the toxic people in your life. I don't see that here. What do I see here? Love them. Suffer along with them. Pray for them. Love them. Do you have to love their sin? No. Do you have to put up with it? No, you've got to deal with it. But you don't ever give up. Especially, especially, especially for those people that... God has put you in this sphere with them. Kids, family, loved ones. Take that and apply that to your next door neighbor because we're supposed to love our neighbors ourselves. <sighs> we got to love our neighbor. We, you see, folks, I, I've said this so many times before, but I believe it to the very core of my being. Jesus has not called us to a life that we can live apart from him. This is a supernatural life. You have to have a supernatural being living in you to do this. This is not the kind of thing you decide tomorrow to do. This is produced by the Holy Spirit of God. So the problem with the Corinthians is they were trying to do ministry using spiritual gifts apart from the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. You've got to have love for any of it to matter. And this is the nature of it. This is what it looks like. All right. Never failing love. Look at the last part of this. This is usually where we stop right here or partway through verse 8. Charity never faileth. That's usually where all of the quoting of this chapter stops. But there's a whole bunch more and it's really important. So watch what he says. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So what he's talking about now are these spiritual gifts. And here's what you need to understand about this last part. <clears throat> what Paul is saying is, you Corinthians have, who have put so much emphasis on these spiritual gifts, and yet you are missing the fact that you're supposed to love each other. All these spiritual gifts, they are temporary. They are not going to last forever, but love is. And so what you need to do is focus on that which is going to last forever. Not only that, but spiritual gifts are partial and love is complete. Look what he says. For we know in part. Now this is the Apostle Paul. You think, my goodness, if anybody had a revelation of God, it would be him. Look at how much of the New Testament the Holy Spirit used Paul to write. Yes, but he still says we only know in part. And we prophesy in part. That's what was happening at that point in time. You had one apostle coming over here, and he was telling part of the story. And you had someone else coming over here, and he was telling part of the story. Peter. Peter spent three years with Jesus. He was telling part of the story. He goes up to Antioch, and he's hanging out with all the Gentiles. And then the Jewish guys come up. No, Peter, he stopped eating with the Gentiles because he knew the Jewish guys wouldn't like it. And he went over here and stopped eating ham and cheese sandwiches and fried catfish. And he went and sat at a different table. 
And Paul had to rebuke him to his face. Peter, you're wrong. God has accepted all. And God has done away with those food laws. And so, so you, need to, you need to take that part that you have, and you've got part, Peter, but you need to add it with this part that I've got, and you've got to put it all together. All right? Can you see that? you got parts. And so in their day, they did not have a completed New Testament. These things were not written until a few years later as, they, as the Holy Spirit got all of these put together. And then they got them all combined and they started getting all these parts. So you've got, you've got one letter, maybe. You start out with Galatians, first letter that Paul wrote. And pieces and parts of Acts, maybe a gospel. And then Paul writes First and Second Thessalonians. And here comes the book of James. And you add that in and you go down the list. Revelation is years to come. 10 years or 15 years or something until you get Revelation. So, so 1 Corinthians is pretty early. And so you've got pieces and parts. Can you see? We know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that can't be Jesus because of neuters, masculines and feminines. If that was speaking of Jesus, it would say when He comes because it would be masculine. But the perfect here is in the neuter. That's why it keeps it in the neuter. It calls it a that. When that which is perfect has come. So this is not talking about the return of Jesus. All right? So you can, you can rule that out. So what is it talking about? When that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. And I'm going to tell you, to be real honest with you, that depends on who you talk to. All right? So this is one of those things that's really kind of fun. And there's guys that will go to the mat on both sides of this. And I'm not one of them. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ride the fence on this one because I really think as I do the study on this, I, I, think, I think I can show you what he means by this. This is talking about a time yet future at that point in time. When that which is perfect is come. We're not there yet. Now we're in part, then that which is perfect. What's perfect mean? It doesn't mean sinless. It means complete. So in your mind, think about this. Partial versus complete. All right? We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is complete is come, then we will know as we have been known. That's what he's going to say down there. He also ties whatever this is to maturity. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So whenever that which is perfect has to do with Christians coming to maturity in the faith, okay? And then it has to do with a reflection. Now we see through a glass darkly. He's talking about a mirror. He's talking about a mirror in their day, which was polished metal. And I don't know about you, but if you have ever seen a highly polished piece of metal, think a knife, think a, a nice new stainless steel case knife. You could not only shave with it, but you could look at it and use it for a mirror to shave with because it's a good reflection. That same piece of steel, if not that highly polished, is difficult to see your reflection in. Okay? They didn't have painted glass like we do. They had polished metal. So he says, we look in this mirror and it doesn't reflect things perfectly. We see darkly, which makes sense because we've got pieces and parts. That, you see? you got parts, you see darkly. But then, face to face. I, I'm going to look in a mirror and it's going to be a perfect representation of the one standing in front of it. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I am fully known, and I will fully know at that point in time. This is why there will be no need for a word of knowledge, because everybody's going to know. By the way, <clears throat> that's what Isaiah tells us, that a day is coming when they'll all know God, from the least to the greatest of them, all right? And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Let me just take you to two passages of Scripture. First, go to Ephesians, if you will. I tell you what, first go to James. Let's go to James first. James 1. James chapter 1, verse 22. All right, so he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Okay, so we're talking about the word of God. Take the word of God, what you learn in it, put it into practice. All right? For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Ah, similar to what we saw in 1 Corinthians, looking in a mirror. So, if you hear the word, but you don't do it, it's like you looking in a mirror, and when he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straight way forgetteth what manner of man he was. So you don't take a good look, or the look isn't real good, and you forget what you saw when you go away from it. 
Now watch what he says in verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now what he's doing is, is he's relating the Bible, the Word of God, to a mirror. And he says when you read the Bible, it's like looking in a mirror. And when you get a good look at yourself, and then you do something about it, that's a mature person, that's a godly person. But when you get a good look and then go away and just forget about it, that's not a good place to be, all right? But he calls the Word of God the perfect law of liberty. Now let's go to Ephesians. Take a look here with me. He says in verse 11 of chapter 4, Ephesians 4, 11. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. All right, so we're talking about gifting of these guys in the church. What are they for? For the perfecting of the saints. There's that word again. For the completing of the saints. So my job is to help build in your life. That's, that's the, the, the point. Pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. These guys are to, to help bring the partial to the complete or perfect for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till there's a timing word right when that which is perfect is come and here we have another timing word till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man or a complete man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children. Hey, there's a, there's a maturity reference just like we saw in 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I put away childish things, he says. Ephesians says something very similar here. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby thy white lion wait to see. But speaking the truth in what? Love. The whole point of chapter 13. Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him and all things, which is the head, even Christ. So what is 1 Corinthians talking about? Well, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's, let's look at it real quickly. We know in part and we prophesy in part. I think, I think what Paul is saying is, is he's saying in the apostolic time, they did not have the perfect word of God at that point in time. It was in the making. It's not going to take very long before they have it. So they did not have the New Testament completed. But once you have the New Testament complete, then that can be used, just like uh, 2 Timothy says, that <clears throat> all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction, doctrine, righteousness, instruction, and righteousness. Man, I should know this one. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for uh, correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Different word. Man, I wanted it to be the same word. That would make this so easy, but it's a different word in Greek. But you can see how the English translates it, that it, is, it makes you perfect. So, so the Word of God takes and makes you perfect. What does that mean? Sinless? No. It means complete. It means that you have all the pieces and parts. You know the whole story. You've got everything that you need for life and godliness. All right? And so he says, but when that which is perfect is come, some people say that means the completed canon of Scripture. That once the completed canon of Scripture came, that there was then, therefore, no need for any of the apostolic gifts. And I, about 85%, go with that because, think about it, we don't live in a partial time now. Imagine if some guy prophesied in Estonia. Well, we need that, don't we? Some guy who calls himself an apostle. Today we have women that are calling themselves apostles. And they have a prophecy. Well, gosh, that's what this is. This is the, the apostles' doctrine right here. We need to add a chapter to our book, don't we? Well, that's ridiculous. Revelation says, if you add to this or you take away from this, God's going to take away your part. I mean, there's some pretty serious stuff about that. No, no, no. The canon is complete. All right? However, when we look at Ephesians, I think Ephesians answers our question. It's till we all come to a perfect man. Now, that's not going to happen until we get to the millennial kingdom, beyond the millennial kingdom even. And so, so is it possible that spiritual gifts still exist in our day? Yes, I think so. I don't think that they have all ceased. However, 
do we see things happening like they were in 1 Corinthians? Most of the time when we see those things, they're not done biblically. Uh, I, I see tongues out of control all the time. I, I've been in a prayer meeting where everybody was all praying at the same time. Some of them praying in tongues, some of them praying in English, and I just, I, I just stood there. I just stood there looking around. I'm like, what is going on? Because I'm sorry, but my little mind, oh, no, I, no, I, I can't. I'm, 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 I'm lost. I'm, I'm just. And so I'm like, Lord, I don't really know what's going on here. I'm sure you could sort all this out, but I can't. There was no edification whatsoever for me. Now, I've been in other prayer meetings where we touched heaven. And it wasn't out of control and confusion and all that kind of stuff. So what's he saying? He's saying that the Corinthians are focusing on the manifestation of the gifts. And they are not doing it in love. And so what they're doing is, he says, these things aren't even going to last forever. But love is going to last forever. So, so what you're doing is, is you're putting all your emphasis on these things that are pieces and parts and temporary things instead of putting all your emphasis on the eternal the thing that never fails is prophecy going to fail yes one of these days we're not going to need prophecy anymore knowledge we won't need knowledge we'll everybody will know these things it'll, it'll it'll be manifested we'll see it we'll be living in it the millennial kingdom will be here we won't be needing to to d- decide whether was it really a thousand years or not you know i mean all of that is we would be completely irrelevant but not love Love is always relevant for every age, in every church, in every situation. And so what should we focus on? Love, faith, and hope. These are the building blocks of the Christian life. These are the motivating factors for everything that we do. Love believes all things, and love hopes all things. So when I'm dealing with a wayward child, do I need some special tool? Yeah, you need love. That's what you need. You need love and you need prayer and you need the Word of God. And guess what? You've already got all those things. You have everything that you need. By the way, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit can manifest Himself any way that He would like to in your life. I, try, I, I hope that you understand this morning, I long to put zero restraints on God. I, I, God can do anything that He wants to do. So, could there still be tongues? A language that I didn't learn, that I miraculously speak, that is understandable by somebody else. Sure there could, but I don't see it. we got Bible translators all over the world. They're not just walking up and talking to people. They're learning languages and translating the Word of God into those languages. So, uh, matter of fact, I want to close by telling you my tongues story. The only time in my life that I have ever prayed for tongues was in Venezuela. Early one morning, I went to get some coffee, and I had bought, before I went on this, a a Bible that had English on one column and Spanish on the other, and I had that with me, and I sat down at a bus stop to finish my coffee, and there were lots of kids there, and this young lady walks up on her way to school or something, and my Spanish is dismal, all right? It's, I know just enough to get me into a conversation and then into trouble. That's, That's all I got, right? So I start out with a wonderful greeting, you know, como esta, hola, and they go, and I'm like, I'm done. <clears throat> so, so this, the, and I, I was reading my Bible that morning, I was praying, I mean, I'm in Venezuela, I'm on a mission trip, I'm going to lead people to Jesus, I, I got just a short period of time, and here this, this gal walks up, and she asks me if she can sit at this, the other seat at this table that I'm sitting at, sure, sit down, como esta, bien, bien, gracias, <clears throat> donde va? Oh, escuela. I got the school part. Okay, she's on her way to school. Okay. Uh, 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 como estudia? Cuando estudia? I don't know. I don't know. How do I say it? What are you studying? Oh, okay. I don't have any idea. And I sat there for a minute. I said, Lord, please let me speak Spanish enough to lead this gal to Jesus. Let me just share the gospel with her. And I lift my tongue and ah, come out Spanish. And it just, it just didn't. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, you have a Spanish Bible in front of you. Just Ethiopian eunucher. And so I said, uh, <clears throat> mira por favor. And I turned my Bible around and I turned to Ro- Romans 3.23 and I pointed to it. I said, 
Leer, por favor. And I said that because that's what my Spanish teacher, Mrs. Uh, uh, Gutierrez, used to say, you know, Leer, por favor, Rodney. So I would leer. And so, so she reads it. Oh, see? And then I turned to Romans 5.8. Leer, esta verso. So she reads it. And then I turned to Romans 6, 3, 23. I said, read this one. And she reads that one. And, and I looked at her and I'm like, you know, what do you think, you know? Oh, sí, sí. I said, uh, tú necesitas creer en Jesucristo. And I think that means you need to believe in Jesus Christ. And she looked at me and she nodded. See? Sí? And her bus pulled up. Oh, it's me, autobus, adios. Away she goes, you know? And I'm like, oh, Lord, I wish I could speak Spanish. But you know what that did to, to me? I mean, it just, it just hammered home a couple things. Hey, if you're going to be a missionary, learn the language of the people that you're going to see. And number two, the importance of the Word of God. Somebody at some point in time did a lot of really, really hard work translating that Bible. If they had simply believed, all I have to do is go in the name of Jesus and He'll give me the ability to speak to these people without doing any kind of hard work or study, that's what we'd be doing. We'd be sending missionaries and just going, pray, and they'd go over there and they'd just preach in Uzbek or something. But guess what? That's not happening, all right? And yet it did for a time in the Apostle Paul's life. So here's my, here's my, my encouragement to you today. You've got everything that you need to do ministry. You just need to love people. Quit taking the cop out of, well, that's not my gift. I can tell you, I don't see anywhere in there the gift of making casseroles. Do you see, anybody see that? I, I've never seen it. And yet, if you're going to love people, that's a great way to do it. Amen? Uh, there, there, there's, there's, just, there, there's just unlimited ministry opportunities when you love people, when you have a giving heart that comes from Jesus. So just love people and go to work. Amen? Amen. Father, we just love you and we thank you for your word. And God, we just pray, Lord, that, that you would just keep us focused on the main thing. We don't want to be like the Corinthians and be immature and get caught up in a whole bunch of things that that uh, lead us off of the right path. And we don't want to be like the Ephesians, Lord, and, and, and get so, so bogged down and, and so focused on our doctrine that we leave our first love. Lord, we want to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we want to love other people. You've given us a commandment, Lord Jesus, a new one, that we should love one another even as you've loved us. By this will all men know that we're your disciples. The most excellent way is the way of love. Let us walk in that, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray.